A warm welcome to a very special Points West on the day the Duke of Edinburgh has died. In our programme tonight, flags at half-mast. We're live in Tetbury, home to the royals as the town remembers the late prince. One has wonderful memories of the amazing things that he's done for this country, showing how much he appreciated it and, and how much he wanted people to just sort of relax and, and be happy. His passion for the sea, how the Duke's determination saw the SS Great Britain return to Bristol. We remember his military links to the West, not least as patron of Somerset's Fleet Air Arm Museum. He's been a huge influence all the way through and we've been in contact um, for, for all my life. I mean, he was a, a surrogate father for me. And how the Duke of Edinburgh Awards inspired one of our greatest adventurers, David Hempelman Adams. Good evening and welcome to a programme looking back at the life of the Duke of Edinburgh and his special connections with the West. Ours is a region that the Duke returned to time and again during his long years of service. And tonight we'll remember his links with our military, his visits to our towns and cities and the impact that he had. First night, let's go to Gloucestershire, which is so closely associated with the royal family. The news of the Duke's death will be keenly felt in Tetbury, where Prince Charles lives nearby at Highgrove. Our Gloucestershire reporter, Steve Nibbs, is in Tetbury for us this evening. Steve. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Just a mile away from where I am at the moment, actually, is Highgrove House, the Gloucestershire home of the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. Uh, we understand that Prince Charles left Highgrove this afternoon to be with his mother, the Queen, at Windsor Castle. And shortly afterwards, floral tributes started to arrive from well-wishers, leaving them at the gates to Highgrove. And tributes have been paid to the Duke of Edinburgh from right across the community in Gloucestershire. This is a county that has some of the strongest Royal links, of course, outside of London and here in Tetbury, a town synonymous with the Royals. They've been part of life here for decades. And today there was sadness and reflection at the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh. Within minutes of the announcement of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, the flag at the parish church in Tetbury was lowered to half-mast. The muffled bell tolled a hundred times. This is a town where the Royal connections are strong and the loss of Prince Philip will be keenly felt. Real concern that we support the community at this point of sorrow and loss and that we're there for the community. Prince Philip, it was a, a long life, well lived, marked by faithfulness and steadfastness, his support for Her Majesty the Queen um, and the way that he enabled wonderful things to be done uh, here and across the world. Gillian and John lowered the flag in their back garden today. John is a tour guide at Highgrove nearby and was in the Grenadier Guards when Prince Philip was Colonel of the Regiment. The couple met the Prince at a Royal Garden party. Somebody very passionate, somebody very loyal, and somebody with great spirit. So whenever you saw him, there was always a little sort of, almost a wicked little sort of smile on his face, um, because showing how much he appreciated it and, and how much he wanted people to just sort of relax and and be happy. Mm. Brian and Sheila grew up as part of the same generation as the Queen and Prince Philip. For them, he was always there, and his passing, despite his recent ill health, still a shock. I'm very sad, actually. Sure. I find he and the Queen were brilliant together, and he was wonderful for the country, and I just feel very sad, actually. A book of condolence has been opened in the parish church with a service of evening prayers tomorrow night for local reflections on the passing of a prince who will be mourned across the country. Steve Nibbs, BBC Points West, Tetbury. Well, one of Prince Philip's passions was sailing, and it was his huge enthusiasm for it which saw the SS Great Britain return to Bristol back in 1970. And David is there for us now. Hi, David. Good evening, Alex. You join me on board the SS Great Britain at this time of a national sorrow for uh, Prince Philip. Now, this ship, this project, was very close to the Prince's heart. When plans were announced to bring it home from its watery grave in the Falkland Islands, people thought it was crazy. Uh, Prince Philip himself thought it was blooming lunacy, except he didn't use the word 
blooming, he used another one. Yet, 50 years on, here we are. It was back in 1970 that Prince Philip stood on this very deck, the weather deck. I was among the 100,000 people waving from the side as the ship came home. And this project was just one of many that the Prince was involved in in his visits to us in the west of England. They had their walkabouts refined to perfection. Her Majesty did one side of the street, her Prince the other. But Philip knew there can only be one monarch, and when this little girl wanted to be close to the star, the Prince's occasionally crusty facade melted. Oh, it was brilliant. Good, wasn't it? Eh? Very special. The 800th anniversary of the granting of Gloucester's first royal charter. Whenever they came to the West Country, they attracted huge crowds. In the 50s, he was a dashing, handsome young man, bursting with ideas and enthusiasm, a breath of fresh air into an institution set in its ways. He was, at heart, a real moderniser, and he was fascinated by technology and science and design. He was a very, very well-rounded man. He was everything that Elizabeth needed during her reign. He had a good sense of humour, so he, he was a great companion for her. And without that, I think she would have... I think it would have been... A, the reign would have had a very different feel. No, I, I think he's been absolutely wonderful. And the public loved him, and, and he was... Um, the most glamorous man in the world. I mean, host, everybody was in love with him when he married the Queen. Including you. Mm. Mm. Madly, we all were. The Gloucestershire author, Jilly Cooper, not only adored Philip, she admired his service. What I loved about him is he made no secret of his board. Which I, I, I mean, like everybody else, you know, he, but, he, but he worked and worked. And what a job to have to walk t t three yards behind somebody all your life. He loved anything daring and had a passion for the sea. So when the SS Great Britain returned to Bristol, he threw himself into the project. A hundred thousand of us lined the Avon to see a rusty hulk of the old ship return to the dock where it was made, with Prince Philip on deck. It was pretty scruffy, there was no question about it, but it had, been, it had been considerably tidied up. But the interesting thing was, when she was floated out of the dock, uh, the Prince Consort was on board, and when she was floated back into the same dock, I was on board. And 20 years later, the Matthew, the tiny ship that sailed to Newfoundland, was recreated in those same docks. Prince Philip was once again caught up in the salty drama of adventure, and you sensed he would have loved to have swapped his suit for the captain's chair and the freedom of the seas. Concorde also captured the Prince's love of technology. He could fly both fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters. But when asked about the supersonic experience, he was typically super restrained in his response. It's very disappointing <laughs> from that point of view. I mean, there is literally no difference. The Duke of Edinburgh didn't take fools kindly, but new people could be nervous around him, which is why he often used humour to break the ice. At Lynham, sending himself up. You are going to see the world's most experienced pluck unveiler. It was a wry comment, but he unveiled endless plaques and shook millions of hands with grace. A straight talking man with an even straighter back, Captain General of the Royal Marines for 60 years. He was very fond of uh, his association, a huge supporter. Uh, of our, our, our activities. Uh, he would often visit uh, units around the globe, including 40 Commando in Malta, when they were stationed there in 55. Uh, and he was, he was also very interested in, in the individuals as well. And when he eventually retired from public life, the Duke of Edinburgh raised his hat to 40 Commando from Somerset, who gave him a ceremonial send-off. For most of us, the Duke has been a presence in our lives, for all of our lives. Now he has gone, and our part of the kingdom celebrates his remarkable life and mourns his death. We uh, salute you, sir. Uh, just in passing, the first association that the Prince had with 
uh, this ship was in 1957 when he piloted a seaplane over its watery grave in the Falklands. That was before even I was born. The SS Great Britain, I suspect, will be here uh, for many years. She's done her duty, she's stoical, and she's made of iron. In many ways, uh, like Prince Philip himself. But when you take away all those projects, the essence of the man is that he was a father and a husband. And it's to Her Majesty the Queen and her children that we send our deepest sympathies tonight. Alex. David, thank you so much. That was very moving and a beautiful tribute as well. Well, I'm joined in the studio now by one of the Queen's representatives here in the West Country, Bristol's Lord Lieutenant Peaches Golding. You were nodding there as well. That was a very moving tribute, wasn't it? It was indeed. Unlike David, I was alive when the Duke of Edinburgh flew over the SS Great Britain. And like many people watching tonight, we were, we were glued to that scene of the SS Great Britain sailing into Bristol Harbour with of course, the Duke of Edinburgh on board. So yeah. the times that you must have met him, um, how has he come across to you and uh, what were your impressions? He's a very bright man. You know, you cannot make jokes if you're not aware, if you're not intelligent, if you don't know what the circumstances are. You have no ability to make a joke. And the fact that he had such a wonderful sense of humour shows just how connected he was with everything. And of course, the Commonwealth was important to him. You know, it was in Kenya where Her Majesty was actually made queen, wasn't she, with the very sad death of her father. Mm. So, you know, he's got that link with the Commonwealth just right around. Um, he's just so knowledgeable, mm. wonderful man. I think he certainly would keep people on their toes. Um, it was interesting what David said there, because I've seen this said many times today in, in terms of, let's forget, it wasn't just as a man of ser in, who was in service, it was also the fact that he was a dad and a granddad and so on, and a husband, a loyal husband. So um, what does, uh, how do you recollect and, and see that natural man as opposed to the man in his role? Well, I can imagine with his grandchildren, he was great fun. I can remember when he came to Bristol and the Lord Mayor um, at the time was, was Colin Smith and he and I were waiting to receive His Royal Highness and he came into the back and of course Colin had all the chains on and the Duke of Edinburgh went up to him and he went thump, thump, thump. Is that real gold? <laughs> so I can imagine as a grandfather he really delighted his grandchildren. He could get up to the best devilment, wouldn't you think? <laughs> Absolutely, but can you imagine how hard it would be to know how to correctly react you know, to the Duke of Edinburgh and how much fun you can have in that situation? I think you'd probably find yourself tested there. Um, what do you see in, in, in the coming days in terms of the country and also in terms of protocol and what comes into place now? Yes, there will be some set activities that, that will take place. So there will be a service at the Catholic Cathedral in Bristol on Sunday morning. And there will be a service at the Bristol Cathedral on the 14th. Now, I'm sure you'll have to book to attend those, but there will be services. We know that people will want to bring tributes um, to remember the remarkable life of the Duke of Edinburgh. And so we're asking that if they're brought down to the cathedral, that they're put on the north side of the church there. And we're also saying because, you know, he was the first patron of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, you know, and his environmental knowledge and interests were great. And we want to honor and respect that by asking people not to have cellophane on the flowers that they lay, because we'd like to be able to compost them and use them in the city's flower borders. Nice, that's really nice. Peaches Scolding, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and you've um, reminisced beautifully uh, about having met the, um, the late Duke. So thank you for, very much for that. Thank you for asking me, Alex. Well, as we have heard already, the Duke of Edinburgh had long and proud connections with the military based here in the West, and particularly the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Somerset. Prince Philip was a huge supporter of it, and as Andrew Plant reports, was there at the very beginning. 26 years ago, the Duke of Edinburgh at the unveiling of his portrait, his dry sense of humour also on display. What do you think? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> 
and here it still hangs, watching over the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm Museum. Prince Philip, a patron of the collection for more than half a century, after he laid the foundation stone when the museum was built back in 1964. He was Royal Marines, so he was a captain general um, and always was a keen supporter of all things Royal Navy, but in particular naval heritage and all of the museums which now form part of the National Museum of the Royal Navy. In Yeovil today, the chairman of the local Royal British Legion remembered his meetings with Prince Philip, like many former military personnel, deeply affected by today's news. But a very, very genuine person. Uh, and like I say, a, a combat veteran, same as myself, and very, very uh, positive for the armed forces. Arriving by the Royal Train, the Queen and Prince Philip last visited Yeovil in May 2012 as part of her Royal Diamond Jubilee tour, taken to a traditional country fair. Many in the town today remembered their visit. Prince Philip was by her side all, all his life, all their lives. So yes, it was, they were very good together. It's yeah, very sad for him to pass away before his 100th birthday, which I'm sure the, the uh, uh, royal family were looking forward to. He's forthright and he says what he means, but that's what I like. <laughs> no, it, I, I just love the royal family, so I've yeah, grown up with them. The Duke of Edinburgh was a staunch supporter of all the national museums of the Royal Navy and will continue, they say, to watch over the military history, the Royal Navy heritage here, which was so close to his heart. Andrew Plant, BBC Points West, in Yeovil. Well, the news has touched people right across the region. Will Glennon has been out in one part of Swindon to find out how people there are reacting to the news. I've been in Gorse Hill in Swindon today, where coincidentally you'll find the Duke of Edinburgh pub. Now, I've spoken to a number of ordinary men and women here, and they've all said to me that they think it is a sad day today, and they've expressed their condolences, their thoughts are with the royal family. People have said particularly with the Queen, who's lost her husband, the man she's been married to for such a long time. An amazing man, and he will be missed. I think he will be missed by the whole country. He's a phenomenal figure. The royal family are phenomenal figures and uh, always done um, amazing work for society and uh, it's just, uh, just a sad day, really. I feel for the Queen. I think you can't be married to somebody for that many years and it not have an effect on your life. I think he was probably a real character and that side of him will be missed by a lot of people. I think it's very, very sad. I feel very, very sorry for the Queen. She's going to be lost without him after all these years, I think. And lots of people have said that he's given a great deal of service over the years. He has indeed, something? with not a great deal of recognition, I don't think. He's done it very quietly in the background, a lot of it. And it'll be sad, to, sad for her, sad for the whole family. And here at the very busy and well-known junction of transfer bridges, on the electronic billboard next to the railway line, a final tribute to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. Will Glennon there. Well, there have been many tributes to the Duke from the West's politicians, past and present. Here's our political editor, Paul Baldrop. Through his decades of public service, the Duke always had close connections with the military. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind, says former Defence Secretary and Bridgewater MP Tom King, but it earned him many admirers in the military. I had the great honour of uh, being the, his host um, uh, and welcoming him on his 70th birthday on Horse Guards Parade. When, and some people may remember this because it was all tele, you know, on television. When his 70th birthday, he was Captain General of the Royal Marines and they beat retreat for him on Horse Guards. And uh, it was a wonderful occasion and it brought out very clearly the tremendous affection uh, and respect for him. Also impressed by his ability to win over those he met is the former MP for Bath. I had this rather peculiar role called uh, the Comptroller of the Household at things like the Royal Garden parties where you have to walk down the lines of people behind either the Queen or the Duke of Edinburgh and he would come up and within minutes nearly always you'd hear people laughing. He'd said something or he'd responded to something they'd said and so on. He was very, very good at putting people at ease. Others remember him for what he did for the young, especially his awards scheme. 
personally. I have benefited from some of the Duke of Edinburgh's work. I participated in the bronze expedition and the gold expedition and for a young person growing up I've often said that actually one of the key interventions in my life was the opportunity to get outside the city boundaries to experience nature to have adventure and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, award uh, was actually my pathway to entering into that ward, uh, world which made such a difference to me. Flags over City Hall and across the west are at half mast in honour of the Duke. Paul Bartrop, BBC Points West. Mm. Well, the mayor of Bristol isn't the only person to have been influenced by the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. Forty years ago, it unleashed the adventurous spirit of a Swindon schoolboy called David Hempelman Adams, who, of course, went on to become a world famous explorer. And as he's been telling me, it was also the start of a deep and lifelong friendship with Prince Philip. Very sad day. Um, it's been in my mind for a long, long time. And when it actually happens in reality, it's always a shock. So, um, yeah, a very, very sad day for everybody. It wouldn't be an underestimation to say that um, His Royal Highness had an enormous effect on your life from an early age. Absolutely. All the way up to just a few months ago, I was still getting letters from him. Uh, I did his scheme at the age of 13, and that's how I got into adventure. And he was a patron to lots of my big expeditions and also to uh, my children. So he's been a huge influence all the way through, and we've been in contact um, for, for all my life. That's quite something, isn't it? An adventurer like yourself to be influenced by this one person starting off with, with your award and then taking it from there. What, did he reflect back to you what that meant to him? Well, I, I met him a lot of times because I did the scheme and then I was a patron of his scheme. So we, we had quite a lot of time together at dinners and things. But um, he, he brought uh, so much to so many people, so well, millions and millions of people who did his scheme and from myself to other people, it was, at, you know, it was at the right time of my life to be a huge uh, influence. And whenever he was a patron on my expeditions, he would get me up to his library and it was no cups of tea or anything. It would be a, a real interrogation <laughs> of what I was doing. And when I get got back, he would always ask really, really searching questions. So. It wasn't just a tick on the box. He was really, really interested. That is interesting. So, obviously, you've known him in a, in a personal capacity. What was he like? Uh, wonderful. I mean, he was a, a surrogate father for me. And um, he was just extraordinarily kind. And I, I often got frustrated with the media that sometimes he got. Uh, and, it, and really, um, it was a, a shame, because he was nothing like that. He was very generous, very kind, very thoughtful. Uh, a, a real wonderful person, and I think uh, our country owes him a huge debt. Well, David Templeman, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, millions have been involved with the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme since it started. Scott Ellis has been to Bath to meet some of those who are part of it today. It is some legacy. 6.7 million teenagers have a D of E award, including Bath pupil Toby, who's done bronze and silver and is working on gold. Each requires a weekly commitment to voluntary work, learning a new skill like music or drama, and a physical pursuit. And he'll never forget the expedition. The most memorable thing I've done by far is uh, trying to get up this massive great big hill at the, in Exmoor. It was incredibly steep, incredibly windy, and we were basically crawling up it. And you get stuck in these tough conditions or it's chucking down the rain and you've got to try and build a tent and things like that. I think that's, that's really key and something you definitely don't get just being in a classroom. All this the brainchild of the Duke of Edinburgh back in the 1950s, inspired by his headmaster, Kurt Hahn. And he felt that if you could get young people to succeed in any area of activity, that mere sensation of success would spread over into a lot of others. Back then, it was about bridging the gap between school and the army. You look that way. Now, it's a worldwide charity scheme and as popular and relevant 
as ever. So we've got some gold students at the moment that are volunteering their time at the local vaccination centres. They're cooking meals for their families at home during uh, lockdown times. I still have students e emailing me, contacting me now, saying what a fantastic time they had. The South West director of the scheme has met Prince Philip. Um, and he was a charming gentleman. And is sure his legacy will live on. Last year we had 28,500 young people taking part, which was fantastic. So I, I absolutely believe the, the charity and the programme will continue um, and young people will be able to take part going forward. This is his legacy. I think that's an amazing thing to have. Inspiring millions of young minds must rank as one of Prince Philip's finest lifetime achievements. Scott Ellis, BBC Points West. An incredible legacy. There will be so many memories of the Duke and you've been emailing us your favourite moments already. Thank you for those. And your BBC local radio stations on air all evening with a special programme. They would love to hear from you about how you will remember him. Right, it's time for our weather now and Ian is as ever on the roof. Good evening, Ian. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. Hello, everybody. Well, let me show you how the radar has been looking over the last few hours. It's been dominated by the passage of a cold front running its way southwards in fairly fragmentary fashion, it has to be said, all the while tending to weaken as well, but still delivering some showery rain now as it's running down through parts of the West Country, including here in Bristol. And uh, we're going to find that that front continues its journey south during the course of tonight. Cold air flooding in behind it. Tomorrow we've got an area of low pressure running across northern France into the Low Countries. And the edge of that, the northwestern flank of it, is likely to give at least some showery rain into our districts during the course of Saturday. By contrast, Sunday, yes, still a cooler or chilly day, but it should be a fairly bright day, perhaps a few showers around, but many areas likely to stay dry. So this is how that front continues its very slow journey southwards, uh, tending to weaken all the while and uh, giving some light to in places moderate rain before it tends to die out later through tonight. Some clearance of the skies up towards the north of our particular region and temperatures will be at their lowest out towards the north and the northeast, probably getting down to about freezing or thereabouts a little bit higher though as you head further down towards the south and the southwest with more cloud around. So into tomorrow then, as a broad rule of thumb, the further west you are, the likely you're the more likely you are to have a brighter, dry or drier day. Conversely, out towards eastern areas, probably anywhere from, say, about the M5 eastwards, we will be prone to catching some showery outbreaks of rain. Some of those have the potential to be heavy in places, but it will certainly be a fairly sort of scattergun approach to where we're having those at any one particular time. And it'll be a day with uh, temperatures below average for the time of year, so somewhere between about 8 to 10 Celsius. And uh, a similar pattern temperature-wise uh, after a cold start on Sunday. As I mentioned, it should be a fairly bright day. There could be a few showers around, but I'm hopeful that, generally speaking, it should be a fairly dry day. Now, there is a growing signal into next week that eventually we'll start to see those temperatures picking back up towards average. And indeed, it's not impossible they could climb a little bit above. So there's likely to be at least some change on the way next week. It's still looking overwhelmingly dry. Alex. OK, Ian, thank you so much for that. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Seb's here with your late news. But I'll leave you tonight with some memories on the day that the West said a fond farewell to the Duke of Edinburgh. Take care. And a very good night.